I'm going to be speaking today on the area of Darwin's theories and writings that hit closest to home for we Homo sapiens and that caused the most controversy in the last 150 years, that of the origins and evolution of humanity. Darwin's famous figure from The Origin of Species depicts the history of life as full of adaptive radiations and extinction, or bushiness and subsequent pruning, of the tree of life. From a Darwinian point of view, radiation and extinction are opposite sides of the same coin. Here, his A and I lineages undergo successive radiations and extinctions, but persist through time. The other lineages do not, and all are extinct except for F. Darwin thus thought that long monophyletic uh, descent implicated in F is rare. Darwin stated this himself in his clear terms. The question here is whether human evolution is a series of adaptive radiations and extinctions, like A or I, or the highly improbable F monophyletic scenario. The origin of species has nothing to say about human evolution, save for the cryptic remark that light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. Darwin's colleague and bulldog, Thomas Henry Huxley, made the first attempt to throw light in, eight, in his 1863 tome, Evidence as to Man's Place in Nature. In it, Huxley concludes that gorillas, chimps, gorillas, and humans, or the CGH clade, were a monophyletic clade within the larger great ape clade. In his 1871 book, The Descent of Man, Darwin endorsed and elaborated on Huxley's analyses. The implications were that the CGH clade descended from a not very remote last common ancestor, or LCA, in Africa, and that human evolution is an A-type lineage, involving an adaptive radiation of that LCA into the CGH lineages and not an F-type monophyletic process. We can call this the Huxley-Darwin hypothesis. What were the basis for the Huxley-Darwin hypothesis? The first was parsimony-based cladistics. The descent of man is filled with descriptions of the derived characteristics of apes that are present in humans. This is important as it reflects modification in the CGH clade and presumably their common ancestor for improved terrestrial locomotion at the expense of arboreal mobility. The second basis was geography. Chimps and gorillas are more closely related to one another than to gorillas. They have a more extensive range and are more speciose and numerous than orangs. Orangs are a relic species confined today to parts of Sumatra and Borneo, although they or their recent ancestors must have occupied most of Southeast Asia in the past. It follows then that apes must have spread from their point of origin to occupy a large range stretching from Africa throughout the rim of southern Asia with the southern Eurasian form subsequently becoming extinct. The distribution of fossil hominoids confirms this. It is not surprising that the species now isolated at the extreme end of this range, the orangs, are relatively unmodified relics. This follows from biogeographical principles rooted in the concept of evolution by natural selection and articulated by Darwin on page 351 of The Origin of Species. By the same token, it is likely that humans, a recent and highly derived production, belong to the more recent speciose and widespread group of apes as opposed to being descended along some isolated line from some very remote common ancestor. In other words, the A and not the F type lineage. Over the past 140 years, however, most scholars of human evolution rejected the Huxley-Darwin hypothesis and proposed an F-type descent for humans. Some proposed separate human and ape descent from a Tarsier-like ancestor, such as Jones in the 1920s, while others proposed separate human and ape descent from a primitive monkey-like form, such as Strauss and Napier and Davis in the 1950s. In the late 1960s, Simons and Pilbeam proposed that humans were descended from Ramapithecus, a Miocene ape found in Pakistan based on tooth enamel thickness. This view was largely accepted until quite recently. For example, in his 1981 book Lucy, famous paleoanthropologist Donald Johansson concludes by resolving to look for Lucy's Ramapithecine ancestor, even after pointing out for hundreds of pages that the African Lucy, at three million years old, is remarkably quite similar to extant chips found not very far from where the fossil was found. Over the past 25 years, the Huxley-Darwin hypothesis has been confirmed by and generally accepted in the face of accumulating molecular, anatomical, and fossil evidence. Immunological, protein, and DNA comparisons leave no doubt 
that the CGH clade shares a recent ancestor in the late Miocene or early Pliocene, roughly 5 to 10 million years ago. It's also clear that the branching order is gorillas, then chimps, and humans, and that this occurred in rapid succession, as one might expect, from an adaptive radiation. This has inspired a closer examination of comparative morphology, and likewise, fossil hunters have unearthed a series of older and more chimpanzee-like fossils, bipeds, in Africa. So it turns out, Darwin and Huxley were right. It follows, then, that if Darwin and Huxley were right about the who, what, where, and when of human origins, we should look and see what their ideas have to say about the why. Still, the core implications of the Huxley-Darwin hypothesis have yet to fully inform efforts to reconstruct human evolution. We should use a Darwinian approach and view human evolution as part of adaptive radiation of one group of African apes right at the time when most of the other Miocene apes are dying out. To do this, we must look at the entire CGH clade to discern what differentiates all of them from an outgroup, in this case, orangs, and then how this feature varies between them. This will tell us which feature was at the heart of the adaptive radiation and how it was selected for differentially in each of the lineages. So let's go back to the beginning. Huxley's phylogenetic analysis is correct because it captures a basic fact. The CGH clade exhibits terrestrial locomotor specializations that are absent in the other extant and fossil apes. These are knuckle walking in chimps and gorillas and bipedality in humans. Both of these locomotor systems entail longer legs and shorter arms, shorter metatarsals, metacarpals, and phalanges, but longer thumbs and big toes, and less phalangeal curvature. All of these changes are associated with a consequent decrease in climbing ability. Knuckle walking is also associated with highly derived modifications of the distal radius and metacarpals present in chimps and gorillas, but not present in humans or orangs. As Darwin pointed out, apes in general occupy an intermediate state between quadrupedality and bipedality. Orangs typify that inter intermediate state. They characteristically walk on their fists in order to maintain the long fingers needed for arboreal mobility. They are also facultative bipeds and facultative knuckle walkers. The habitual knuckle walking of chimps and gorillas is a more strictly quadrupedal mode of locomotion. While Darwin did not draw a distinction between knuckle walking and fist walking, Huxley was aware of the difference, and his analysis of a proportion supports this conclusion, as does a comparison of locomotor behavior among extant apes. The question is why the extant African apes, including humans, evolved these terrestrial locomotor specializations. The CGH clade diverged rapidly from a recent common ancestor. Whatever explains humans' more strictly bipedal condition must also explain the more strictly quadrupedal condition of chimps and gorillas. As Darwin pointed out, the circumstances must have been living somewhat less in trees and more on the ground. And as he further pointed out, with bipedal posture, early hominins would have thus been better able to have defended themselves with stones or clubs, or to have attacked their prey, or to have otherwise obtained food. In short, the natural selective pressure for either bipedality or knuckle walking in the CHLCA must have been related to a change in the conditions of its native country, causing either rising subsistence pressure and greater foraging on the ground, or rising predation pressure while on the ground. Darwin's framework of analysis, however, has been ignored for the last 150 years. Many researchers initially advanced the hunting explanation, but then advanced alternative subsistence explanations as the fossil record had increasingly shown hunting didn't begin to be important in human evolution until two and a half million years after the origins of bipedality. Only a few authors have suggested predation pressure as a cause of bipedality, even though Darwin's language suggests he viewed it as the null hypothesis. He was right about CGH monophyly. Maybe he was right about the origins of bipedality as well. Most importantly, there, have, there has been failure to systematically test subsistence versus predation hypotheses, which are mutually exclusive against all the available evidence. They are mutually exclusive because predation pressure of a macroevolutionary magnitude suggests a population held well below carrying capacity by predation and undergoing a predator-prey arms race in which subsistence ability is traded off for improved anti-predation ability. 